Okay. Heads up there. Hey, thank you so much for doing this, by the way. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. We love you here in Detroit. And before we talk about Sopranos, Detroit 187 got screwed. There, I had to get that out of my system. Okay. You know, that was, um, I think it would, the problem was, I might have worked if now, like if we had, if it was on streaming or something. Um, do you know, network TV, they don't have a lot of patience for shows to grow an audience. And if they don't hit right out of the box, um, they don't stand behind it so much and they don't publicize it enough. So I think that show was really, people in, in Detroit and Michigan really loved it and really connected to it. Well, we did. We loved it. I mean, and, and you're right. It had a, it had this feel that you guys really embraced. I mean, there's a Detroit sensibility, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah. And, 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 and you could feel it in it. And and we did gravitate to it. And that's, you know, it, yeah, it was unfortunate. But that's a good point, though, Michael, about the, when you think about the Sopranos, that we knew from the beginning that it was great. But the fact that it was streaming, that you you were willing to give it more time. Yeah. Did you know from the beginning that you you were in something big? I knew I was in something good, but, you know, cable series at that time was not a thing at all. Um, cable series was like the bottom, ba the bargain basement of television. There, there was not a happening thing. So uh, I knew it was well written. You know, when we shot season one, I knew it was really, really original, but nobody knew if it was going to find an audience, you know? Um, if people were going to watch television series on a cable channel, if they wanted to watch TV where there was violence and nudity and profanity, because uh, that really wasn't a thing then, you know? Um, it really was new ground. So we weren't sure. Yeah, I was thinking like, I was trying to draw comparisons to maybe like FX would roll out the shield or, you know, rescue me on some smaller level, but to this level, as intense from the get go as The Sopranos was. Um, yeah, it, it was amazing. I want to go back though and, and remind everybody comedy and conversation with Sopranos here at Andiamo. I want to look at the Andiamo showroom.com. It is Saturday, November 4th. And, uh, my son, Adam has discovered the Sopranos as well. He's a college student, Michael, and he's in love with it. It's wow. fun. Isn't it? The generations of people, how it just, it's never going to go away. And that's a great thing. It's really surprising. And it's really, really cool and pleasant that young people connect to it and really embrace it and love it. Um, doesn't always happen on TV. It's very rare that, you know, generations after the initial, you know, the people who watched it when it was on, generations after them pick it up. It's, you know, TV has a way often of dating itself, not being yeah. relevant, not being current. And somehow The Sopranos transcends all that. And it's, I, I, it makes me really, really happy. Well, there was this, I was thinking about this because when season six, when you lose, when we lose Christopher, when did you find out? Did you know going into the season that's how that's how you were they were going to do it? Or I can't imagine what that day was like when you shot that scene. Um, I knew a long a way in advance. You know, by the time we shot, you know, by the time we were that this was the last few episodes. I think yeah. there was only three more after that. So it wasn't like, oh, no, I'm getting killed off the show. It didn't feel like that because we were all going. Um, you know, if I was, you know, would have got killed off a couple of seasons before, I think it would have hurt. You know, I would have I would have been disappointed, but I didn't feel that at all. Um, and, you know, what was weird, that wasn't my last day of work because we shoot out a sequence. So it wasn't as final as it may may seem to the viewer because uh, it's the last scene Christopher's in. But we actually shot a bunch more scenes for that episode after that. So it didn't have the finality in a weird way when we shot it. And, um, you know, every scene, those last few episodes, every scene we shot, we were all getting closer to the end. So for all of us, we had that sense that we knew the whole show was was going to wrap up. What a strange feeling, though, to come back on set after you've you've yeah. shot that scene. A strange moment. Yeah, that's TV, you know, and film. Uh, it's shot out of sequence, so 
you're kind of used to it. Um, you know, what, what, what I did take away from that day, and I still will never forget, that accident, you know, when, when the car goes off the road and flips and goes down the hill, there was a guy in the car who flipped that car, and, and there was a stuntman who was in that car and did that stunt driving thing. And we only did one take of it, but boy, was it scary and yeah. really, really impressive at the skill of that that guy and the courage. And he made it through uninjured, which was really impressive. Which I always remember, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'd always heard the story that a spider in um, Goodfellas, you didn't use a stunt double and it wound up sending it to the hospital. That is true. Um, I wound up cutting my fingers open uh, on a glass that was supposed to be a breakaway glass, you know, fake glass, and it wasn't. And uh, I sliced open a couple of my fingers, um, which is never really a, <laughs> a fun thing to happen on the set. No, I was very young. It was one of the first, I think it was the fourth time I was ever on a movie set. Um, but uh, I learned very quickly there's a reason why they're stunt doubles. But you wound up in the hospital, didn't you, didn't you wind up going to the ER? So here you are, you, oh, yeah. I can imagine you coming in with bullet holes in you, all this fake stuff. Did, yeah, they, they thought I was out? about to die. So they <laughs> kind of wheeled me into the uh, trauma center thinking that I was, uh, you know, about to die of several gunshot wounds. And then when I, when they saw the actual squibbing, you know, from the fake bullets, they, they made me wait in the corner to get my fingers stitched up when they saw that what my life wasn't in danger. I had to sit for about four hours and wait for stitches and then go back and shoot a couple more takes. Did you catch hell from any of the, I mean, it's a hell of a cast. It did. Uh, did anybody say anything to you about it after? It wasn't my fault. It was a prop person's fault. Should have gave me a fake glass. They were, they were oh, sympathetic because okay. it was, uh, they should have known better. So uh, you guys are here. It's November 4th, a Saturday at Andiamo in Warren, eight o'clock doors open at seven. On the, on the on the showroom .com, comedy and conversation, you and Steve Strippa and Vincent. And it, it's one of these traditions here in the Motor City. Everyone, it's a full night. We got to go. And um, telling stories, though, was there ever a point where you pushed back on The Sopranos, like you wanted to get away from this character? You know, I did it in the choices I made with roles, you know. Um, but as far as... You know, this business is very hard to succeed in and to be known for something. You know, there's a lot of actors who work who you might not recognize when if you see them on the street or you might, they might look familiar, but you can't place it. But to be actually like Steve, Vinny and myself known for these characters and this, these roles in this show is very hard. And I'm really proud of The Sopranos. I'm proud to be a part of it. I'm proud at the level of quality that is maintained throughout that, that whole, those six and a half, seven seasons, whatever you consider it. Um, so it's not something I really, you know, Steve and I did this podcast and we, we really like kind of being the torch holders of the show in a way, in the history of the show. And we put out a book, an oral history of the show. And doing these shows, the in conversation shows, the live events, really gives a, a, an opportunity to connect for the, to the fans. Um, I'm never, I'm always, um, you know, impressed by the love people have for the show. It's very personal to people, you know. It it's, um, yeah, and that's always fun. I mean, uh, I never take that for granted. I mean, we've been. Uh, to Andiamo a bunch of times over the years, and it's always a really, you know, warm reception from the from the fans and uh, the audiences. Strangely enough, when we go do these events every year, they get younger, um, which you'd think it would be the opposite. But it's very interesting to see, like you said, your son who's in college, college age, and even younger, like embracing this show. When was the first time a celebrity, and I, I wouldn't say another actor, even a celebrity approached you? and said, hey, Christopher, or acknowledge The Sopranos. Like the first time, because obviously being in New York, it, it, we have a Midwest sensibility. If we see celebrities, we just want to nod. We just want someone to go, sup. But is there ever like a time you remember the first time, like, oh, dear God. We, yeah, we were, at a, the Sopranos. we were at an event in Connecticut. And uh, Steve and Tyler and 
and uh, Joe Perry from Aerosmith were there. Um, and uh, they came up to, they were wearing Soprano t-shirts and were big fans of the show. Uh, and that was a real thrill. That was like really early, like season two or something. And, um, you know, I grew up listening to Aerosmith. It was just bizarre that now they kind of were aware of what I was doing. Was it, That was a head trip, you know, it was really exciting. Is this this whole circle where athletes want to be actors and 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 actors want to be athletes and musicians want to be either one? Is that kind of thing? Oh no, they weren't. They didn't want to be actors. They just appreciated what we did. You know, um, uh, that that was just exciting that they were fans of the show. You know? It's always fun, and I, I, I'm sure you guys talk about this. I've always found that we've had Stephen on before that that he, wasn't he originally pitched the role of Tony, or that's something he auditioned for? Steven Van Zandt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He auditioned I, for Tony I can't, I can't conceptualize. I can't see that in my mind's eye. He auditioned for Tony Soprano, yeah. I think David Chase uh, was watching the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony, and Steven Van Zandt introduced the Rascals when they went into the Hall of Fame, and he did this very charismatic funny new jersey italian american speech that david found very engaging and thought oh this was around when he was starting to cast the sopranos and thought this guy he's italian he's from new jersey he has this edge and they brought him in for tony soprano um and i guess david thought well he's not quite right for tony but they created the character silvio dante for uh, steven van zandt it wasn't in the original script. That's okay. That that all right. That that's okay. Yeah, what he was talking about, Michael. Did you ever think that one of the things that with with the Sopranos, the timeline of like with Goodfellas and Casino and and Bronx Tale and everything that was going on with all the the I'm going to say mobster because that's kind of a bigger umbrella. Was there ever a thought that maybe this could become a parody of itself or perceived as that by people? Like, oh great, another mobster show. Oh great, another bunch of guys. You know sitting at a restaurant and, and, and talking shit, pardon my French, but you know, you know what I mean? How, how it could have become a, a character of itself. There's definitely, you know, listen, there's a lot of mob stuff that comes out that's just not very good. Um, you know, when you think the great mob movies, like Godfather to me, Godfather, Goodfellas, Casino to some degree, you know, um, and then for TV, The Sopranos, it's not just that they're about the mob. They were also created by some of the great film and television artists of our time. Coppola, Scorsese, De Niro, Pesci, Al Pacino, Brando, James Gandolfini, Edie Falco, David Chase. You know, um, the fact that they were executed by people who were so top of the craft, I think, really made it happen. And would not allow it to fall into some kind of parody, you know? What was that? Did you ever hear, uh, I, I remember hearing a story that Gandolfini got a phone call one night at home uh, uh, from someone who, who was giving him some tips about how you would handle your business as a boss. Did you ever get a call like that or someone giving you some advice on? on I did. To... I got it. You know, we were in a Rayo's. Rayo's is a famous Italian restaurant in oh, East yeah. Harlem. East Harlem used to be an Italian, like a little Italy. Um, and is not really anymore, but Rayo's has been there since those days. It's been there for a hundred and something years. And it's a restaurant where you have to, you can't get a reservation. Like people own the table. So you would own Monday, Monday nights is your, you know, table five is yours. And if you don't want to go, you can give it to friends. And it's a lot, it's celebrities, mobsters, judges, politicians. Uh, it's this very interesting mix of clientele. The owner, Frank Pellegrino, who, who's sadly no longer with us, passed away a few years ago, was on The Sopranos and played the FBI agent, um, Cuba, uh, Cubitoso. Uh, but I was in there one night with Vinnie Pastor and Tony Sirico. And there was a guy at another table who Tony Sirico knew who I think was a member of the Colombo family. And he offered to teach me the real way to strangle somebody, but I never took him up on it. <laughs> Seriously? 
Oh yeah. And uh, I remember a few a, a few years later, I saw that he went to jail. And then a few years after that, he died. Um, but he was the real deal. I think he was a captain or something in, in one of the families. It might have been the Colombo family. I'm not quite certain. So going back to you as an actor, I mean, you were 23 when you did Goodfellas, right? Is that right? Yes. Okay. What was your big first step? What was that moment where you committed to be, being an actor? Because anyone I've ever talked to in your profession, there's a point where you're either all in or you're going home. What, what was that moment for you? Well, I, I went to, I started taking acting classes right after high school at the same time, trying to get work as an actor, which was very hard and kind of impossible in the beginning. Um, and I didn't get any work as an actor for the first few years. And I, at one, uh, after a couple of years, I thought, well, maybe this is really never going to happen. And um, I was in acting school and I left acting school for a summer and I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. I was very depressed. And um, I ran into someone that I knew who was in the class a couple of years ago. And he said, oh, I, I'm studying with this teacher. She opened her own studio. You should come over there. And I went there and I and this teacher, Elaine Aiken, she's, she passed away a while ago, but she really became a mentor. And um, John Ventimiglia, who played Artie Bucco on The Sopranos, was in that class. And a bunch of us started making theater together outside of class and started our own theater company. And that became, that became my way to, my way in really, like creating our own work. We realized we didn't have to just wait around for people to hire us, that we could do it ourselves. And that was a big step for me. Is that something that, that you, obviously I, I'd imagine you have a lot of men and women come up to you and ask you for advice. I mean, is that the thing you give it where you, you sometimes, like content could be the right word, maybe not, but you create your own opportunities, right? I think, and I always say an actor has to find a way to work. That means in class, maybe. It could mean do a student film. It can mean make your own film. I mean, today people can make movies on their iPhone. You know, when I started, they it was everything was shot on film. You know, making an independent film was not as easy as it is today broadcasting your own stuff is easy today we have youtube and you know it's social media and stuff yeah. a lot of opportunities for that but yeah you know people always say oh it's who you know and i always say it's actually the opposite it's who knows you so you have to kind of find a way to work and then you know people seeing your work or people you work with kind of you know can recommend you for something else or you can, you, you know, you have to build from there rather than people just doing you a favor. It doesn't really work that way. Um, but I always recommend find a really good acting class. And it's not just about being in class, learning under a teacher, which is a really big part of it, but it's also the community that you make with your fellow students, you know, and people telling you each other about what's happening or auditions or little films and student films, independent films that are happening or theater projects. You have to build a community within the world otherwise it's just too broad and big of a world makes sense yeah i could see that um yeah two things number one the nba video that you did is hilarious for the yeah NBA. that was fun i love that that was fantastic you look like you're just having an absolute blast and there's so many players i had to watch it three times i i recognize anthony davis but come on that you had to have a good time doing that I had a great time. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Just go and shoot something with a bunch of guys in the NBA. Yeah. Big stars. We shot it out in LA for a couple of days. Um, I'm a Knicks fan. You know, that's my, uh, my passion. One of my passions. Um, so um, we had a Nick representing us, Julius uh, Randall. So that was cool. But um, yeah, I was a blast. It was a really good time. Sorry about Pazingas last night. He looked a little angry, didn't he? Yeah, it was a little, uh, you know, it's it's a long season, though. So we, it's a long, we, hey, we can't, jump to, it's a, can't jump to any conclusions, right? On the Elmo Showroom .com. You can also go through Ticketmaster as well. Comedy and conversation with the Sopranos, Michael Imperioli, Christopher, and uh, you, Vincent, and Steve Sharippa on Saturday, November 4th here in the Motor City. Last thing, uh, is we're a classic rock station here in Detroit, so obviously we play the hell out of Don't Stop Believing." When you hear that song, does it trigger like a, I wouldn't say a memory, but a reaction to it? Yeah, very bittersweet one, you know, because 
the night of the, the that the finale aired on TV, we none of us had seen it. And we were all in Florida for an event celebrating the finale of The Sopranos. And we did like a Q&A on stage. And then at nine o'clock, it was going to be broadcast. And the people at the event were going to watch on a big screen. And we went into a private room. Most of the principal cast were together. And, you know, when that song came on, to me, I realized it was not just the end of a show, it was the end of a time, because we had so much camaraderie and spent so much time together as a cast. We traveled together and did events all over the country. And we just genuinely liked being together. And it was very, you know, you realized, oh, I'm not going to be with these people all the time anymore. Things are going to change. And it was when that song started playing, I knew the show was almost over and our time together was kind of coming to an end. So when I hear it, I, it takes me right back to that moment. And we talk about classic rock being comfort food for so many people that, you know, like it, it memories. But I was thinking about it as we play that song, obviously, with the connection to Detroit. And yeah, for you guys, it's got to be different. It's got to be different. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you. My son Adam's right over here. You want to say hi to Adam? Sure. Pop your head in here. Hello. Hello, sir. <laughs> we'll He's a you. fan. He, yeah, he, was, he was absolutely, he wanted to hear the conversation and stuff. Right, and, cool. and Michael, yeah. Yeah, we'll see you Saturday and um, can't wait. All the best. And this is just one of those nights that it's going to be a packed house and on the will get your tickets ahead of time. Thank oh, you yeah. so much for the time. This was fun. We'll see you soon. All right. Thank you, Michael. Take care. Thanks.